According to legend, silk was first spun and woven in China nearly 5,000 years ago. This Chinese silk was highly prized and the trade was very profitable for China, so much so that the disclosure of the secrets meant death by torture for the informant. However, through the centuries, the secrets of the craft found their way through Asia, into Europe, through Italy, and into France. In the 15th and 16th centuries, weaving was established at Tours and Lyon. Many of the weavers were Protestants, or Huguenots, as the French called them. In the face of religious persecution, at the end of the 16th century, hundreds of thousands of French Protestants fled from France. Many of these Huguenot refugees were weavers, and some of them settled at Spitalfields near London. Silk manufacture had begun in England as early as the 14th century and had been boosted by the Flemish immigrants in the 16th century. There are records of silkworms being kept for silk production at Moynes Park here in the north of Essex. These mulberry trees were planted in the 1660s. One of these Huguenot families of silk manufacturers, the Walters, had two sons, Stephen and Daniel. In the early 1800s, Stephen moved to Sudbury in Suffolk and Daniel moved to Braintree in Essex. By 1870, Daniel Waters and Sons of Braintree was considered to be the country's leading silk manufacturer. The buildings of the factory in Braintree still stand today, although they are now used for very different purposes. In 1894, Waters was taken over by another firm of Huguenot descendants, the Warner family and the company eventually became known as Warners of Braintree Limited. In 1966, the design team took on an apprentice, Richard Humphreys, who was to become interested in the history of old looms and traditional weaving techniques, as well as designing fabrics. Well, in 1971, uh, Warner and Sons closed their factory at Braintree and, of course, made everybody redundant. The thing was about this that it really uh, marked the end of the Spitalfield weaving traditions in this country as they were the last uh, company in England to carry out this important uh, weaving operation. So apart from uh, being made redundant myself of course the risk was that the tradition of the silk weaver would be lost forever. So um, I made an offer to the company for as much of the redundant machinery as I could possibly afford and we eventually bought a selection of these ancient hand looms. The next problem of course was to try and find somewhere to set these machines up. The main problem being that you need such a tremendous height for the jacquard loom itself and we were very fortunate in finding this redundant uh, primary school in the village of Castle Headingham and this is uh, now the uh, centre for our operations and we are able to manufacture the prestige furnishing fabrics on these ancient hand looms in exactly the same way as they've been operating for the last 150 years. So in 1976, Castle Headingham Handloom Weavers was established in what is now called De Vere Mill in Castle Headingham. The name De Vere is taken from the family who traditionally owned Headingham Castle. All the fabrics produced at De Vere Mill are made to customer specification. Much of the work is reproducing designs and material to replace worn out or rotted material in stately homes and royal palaces, both at home and abroad. First, a design is painted on paper, in the colours and to the size that will appear on the finished material. Once the customer has approved the design, it's transferred and redrawn onto draft or point paper. This is an exact plan of what every individual thread in the material will do. Each square represents the point at which a warp thread will cross a weft thread. Where each thread is to be raised in the weave, the appropriate square is coloured in red. The others are left blank. The red paint is used for coding only and bears no resemblance to the actual colours in the design. 
In 1803, a Frenchman by the name of Joseph-Marie Jacquard invented what must be one of the first computer control systems ever used. The system uses a number of punched cards. Each card represents one line of the draft design. Where the square in the draft design is painted red, a hole is punched into the card. There are 400 squares in each line of the draft. This card cutting machine is over 150 years old. The blank card is inserted into the front slot and gradually fed past a set of punches which are depressed by the operator as required. He reads the draft one row at a time from right to left, cutting the card in rows of eight. The cards are now sewn together. As some designs may be hundreds of cards long, it's important not to get them muddled up and so laced together in the wrong order. Most of the fabrics here are made from pure silk which comes now from China, Brazil and Japan. The silk arrives at De Vere Mill in bulk. It's wound onto skeins. These are then sent away to be dyed to the correct colours. When it's been dyed, some of the silk is wound from the skeins onto bobbins. Other skeins are wound onto cones. Now the warp has to be made. This needs about 300 bobbins to form a band about an inch wide. When the first band has been wound round the mill, it's cut and tied off. Then the second band is wound on, and so on, until the complete width of the warp is obtained. Some warps can contain up to 18,000 threads.
When the warp is completed on the mill, it's transferred to what's called a back beam. This is done under extreme pressure to ensure that the threads are put onto the beam as tightly as possible. The cones are transferred to the pern winder. These perns will fit into the shuttle. The back beam containing the warp fits into the back of the loom and each of the threads has been pulled through to the front of the loom. The shuttle, which will form the weft, is put in place in the shuttle race. In simple, straightforward weaving, the threads of the warp are separated and the shuttle is thrown along the shuttle race, carrying the weft thread. The warp threads are now crossed, trapping the weft thread, and the process is repeated. In more complicated work, like damask weaving, for example, the pattern is created by lifting the warp threads. As the weaver depresses the treadle, the correct selection of threads will be programmed by the jacquard cards at the top of the loom. When the lift of threads is complete, he throws the shuttle along the shuttle race through the warp threads. The weft thread is left in what is called a shed, and it has to be beaten up into the fell of the cloth. The weaver can now depress the treadle again, and the next jacquard card selects the appropriate warp threads for lifting for the next line of the pattern. This process has to be repeated nearly a hundred times to produce a mere inch of completed fabric. At regular intervals, the cards are programmed to cause a bell to ring. This enables the weaver to measure the material to ensure that the tension in the weave is even and that the design is accurate. Velvet weaving involves the use of two warps. One forms the back of the fabric and the other forms the pile. To make velvet, a rod is inserted under the pile warp. This rod is woven into the cloth with the weft thread from the shuttle. When three rods have been interwoven into the cloth, there is sufficient fabric woven to enable the weaver to cut the first rod from the fabric. In the top of the rod, there's a fine groove. A blade is pulled across the fabric following this groove and the rod is lifted out. To make one meter of velvet like this takes two days. This mill is the only one in England currently making hand-cut woven velvets.
The 17th century Huguenot refugees and their descendants had made velvets and other silk materials for royal and ceremonial occasions, and now De Vere Mill is following in their footsteps. As Richard Humphreys says... Well, we do get asked to weave the most extraordinary fabrics here, and I think this is one of the reasons why we survive. Um, I think, for example, if somebody came and asked us to weave spaghetti here, we would have a, a go at that. But um, some of the more interesting things that we've made, um, in particular one of the, the earliest orders was for the Marconi Radar uh, Company, who required to have a fiberglass fabric woven with nickel-plated copper wires inserted and the tolerance of the uh, spacing between the wires had to be so accurate that there was no other way of creating this fabric other than on um, the type of hand loom that we have here. And it is interesting when you think that Marconi uh, making perhaps one of the most modern pieces of technology uh, available today relies upon our 18th century uh, hand looms for this particular uh, sort of product. The other types of fabric that we make here are really uh, one-off uh, fabrics for the aristocrat society uh, of the world and the fabrics are made for the stately homes in this country and abroad, for the royal palaces and um, for the uh, Saudi Arabian uh, palaces as well. Um, we have a selection of materials here that you can, gives you some idea of uh, more interesting fabrics that we have made in the past. This is a silk and cotton damask uh, for the USA. The interesting thing about this design is the background of it, instead of just being plain satin, has this rather interesting check motive in the back. This fabric is a plain material, has a stripe on it, and we make quite a lot of plain materials here, as well as fabrics with a design on it. This is called a tabaret stripe, quite a traditional fabric. This piece gives you some idea of the size of repeat that we can achieve on these old looms. This particular design is very popular within the royal palaces in this country, and the design is used uh, extensively, uh, particularly at Hampton Court Palace. This fabric is a spot velvet, and the velvet technique is employed in this fabric, uh, bringing small spots of the actual velvet to the surface of the material between the satin stripes. This fabric is our plain silk velvet and it's used for ceremonial robes and also uh, antique furniture, um, particularly the King William III bed at Hampton Court Palace is also uh, covered in this sumptuous silk. This fabric is called a tissue. It uses two shuttles in the weft, the beige and the cream, uh, which contrasts with the black satin ground. This next material is also a tissue, but it uses three shuttles, the cream, the green and the blue, to really bring a lot of interest to the surface of this uh, oriental design. This cream damask here gives you some idea of a modern design put onto this traditional quality and this uh, fabric is used uh, for um, an Arab's London apartment to go on the sofas and the final fabric on this stand is a blue damask woven for wall coverings for a palace in Saudi Arabia and this design really gives you some idea of the elegance uh, in uh, the Louis XIV period from which this design uh, was taken.